On this week's Jeep Talk Show, we'll let you know about the latest recall from Jeep, and we hear how FCA has been caught with their pants down with the way they report their sales numbers. We have a ton of tech with your voicemails, our stock the Wheeler project gets some cooling considerations, and we'll share our latest reviews. We get all sciencey and stuff with what an engine oil test can do for you. Tammy's going to be talking tread, Tony's talking trash, and we'll all be talking numbers on episode 240 of the Jeep Talk Show. You're listening to a 4x4 Radio Network Podcast. Are you ready? It's the Jeep Talk Show. With Tammy on Wrangler. Tony and Josh on Cherokee. So sit back. Strap in. And brace yourself. First week in G. From the OK, let's try that again files, Fiat Chrysler is changing the way it reports monthly U.S. sales to make the process more transparent. And as a result <laughs> of the change, its 75 month sales streak actually ended at 41 months in September of 2013. The revelation followed a report on an internal investigation conducted by FCA in 2015 that found the automaker had 5,000 to 6,000 reported sales, which had never been completed. All told, under the new methodology, FCA actually increased its total U.S. vehicle sales since 2011 by a net 18,996 vehicles. The biggest increase, 14,966, was uh, made back in 2014's results. It also underreported results for 2011, 2015, while overreporting in 2012, 2013, and so far even this year, 2016, as of August. The automaker said it went back and reviewed past monthly U.S. sales reports using the new methodology and found a 3% monthly decline in September 2013 when it had previously reported a 1% increase. Likewise, in August of 2015, its U.S. sales would have slipped 1% instead of the 2% increase it had reported. And as recently as May of 2016, its U.S. sales would have dropped 7% instead of the 1% gain it had reported. FCA said the complexity of sales reporting is unique to the U.S. and said that a European-style reporting system relying on registration data, quote, has never been thought to be feasible. Okay. FCA confirmed July 18th that its sales reporting process was under investigation by the Securities and Exchange Commission and the Department of Justice after reports in Bloomberg News and Automotive News. Federal investigators uh, visited all nine of FCA's regional business centers on July 11th and spoke with current and former employees as part of their investigation remains unknown whether the searches and interviews were conducted under a warrant or not. Well, how about a little deja vu? No, I'm not talking about Cinnamon's friend from the club last night. Fiat Chrysler Automobiles said it's recalling nearly 410,000 vehicles worldwide because of a defect that can lead to a loss of propulsion, meaning your vehicle may suddenly lose all power and you could go careening off a cliff and die. <sighs> well, not to worry, though. The automaker said it will update software, <clears throat> yet again, and replace <laughs> wire harnesses to address the electronic issue that appears in a small number of vehicles. Small number? It's 410,000. It's not small to me, but I don't know. Okay, so you mean that an entire harness can, might, and likely will fail, forcing me to go careening off a cliff and die? Well, isn't that just swell? <laughs> so, who are the lucky FCA vehicle owners that have the distinct pleasure of owning a rolling death trap? Well, the recall includes 2015 model year Chrysler 200s, Ram Pro Master City Vans, and of course, 2015 Jeep Renegade and Cherokees as well. Reports also state that some 2014 Cherokees could also be at risk. Fiat Chrysler said there were no reports of injuries or crash crashes related to the defect as of yet, but let's not take any chances, people. The automaker also did not disclose a schedule for when recall repairs will begin. Oh, well, that's just beautiful little cherry on top now, isn't it? Ah, yes, that's right. You bring your, you can just shut off your rig, and then, yes, it, it can do it all by itself. And, yes, you could die, but don't worry. We're working on a fix. You just sit tight and let us handle everything. Oh, you mean like this little golden nugget of advice you're putting out? Quote, if owners suffer a loss of propulsion, the issue can tip, tip, typically be temporarily resolved by stopping the vehicle and restarting the engine. Well, good luck with that while in mid-flight during your trip off that cliff. Thanks, FCA. And of course, thank you guys out there who help us out each and every week by submitting stories for This Week in Jeep. If you have a story you think we should be reporting on or a response to any one of our stories, please send an email to info at jeeptalkshow.com. So in the same uh, thought pattern or vein of the original story that you talked about tonight with FCA's numbers, 
Yeah. And how they, oops, you know, maybe maybe have made a mistake here and there. I'd like yeah. to report that the Jeep talk shows and your download numbers is a billion. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, qu- close to a billion. Billion with an M number, guys. Uh, we are, are as accurate in our number reporting as FCA is. So, you know, I, I, I guess that helps sales when everybody thinks they're doing what everybody else thinks they're doing. I, actually, I think you see this in politics where people want to tell you what the poll numbers are and, and, and the wishy-washy ones are going, well, you know, there was a lot of emails lost, but a lot of people like her, so I'm going to go vote for her. There's a movie back from uh, around 2000, I think, called Boiler Room, where there's a line in there called, uh, or, or uh, where a quote is, act as if. Yes. And I think that's kind of what these guys are doing. Uh, The number counter bean counters over at FCA, uh, who's in charge of, uh, you know, reporting all these numbers and recording all that and whatnot. I don't know what their system is, was, or, or is being turned into or whatnot, but you'd think that that's kind of one of those things that you kind of have to get right. But I guess like, you know, Tony said, it's uh, just all a matter of, uh, you know, metrics and and whatnot and how you present it to the public and what that, uh, what that presentation makes it look like. Yeah. Well, to me, the, just rely on the registration data. I don't get why that. That's kind of my standpoint, hard. too. You didn't think that that <laughs> was feasible. I'm pretty sure the U.S. government's been doing it for decades, but nah, that, that might just be me. It's not hard to count how many, how many, how many widgets you made. And how many aren't at the lot anymore? And if you're, oh, not, I'm pretty it, sure the state I live in, Oregon, knows just how many vehicles are registered <laughs> in the state. I'm, I'm, they count on that money each and every year. Well, they have to make the license plates or stickers or something. So right. you know, you know, I, it's it's really interesting, and and it, it this goes back to the whole thing about how we're constantly being lied to. I mean, constantly. Oh, every, yeah. And and we just go. Oh yeah, what are you gonna do? Well, what are you gonna do? <laughs> it's just. But the sad thing is, a lot of people believe those lies. But yeah. in all seriousness, yeah. folks, just as as a public service, if you do own a 2015 Jeep Renegade or Cherokee, as well as a or a 2014 Cherokee, even, uh, please by all means get into your dealership or at least call them and ask them about this recall and uh, and when you you can expect repairs. Yeah. Yep. Don't want you to. Uh Go careening off a cliff, but no matter how much, how, how much fun it sounds. <laughs> What's up, guys? I'm Kobe. And I'm Jason. From Morgan Trail Off-Road. You're listening to the Jeep Talk Show. Jeep is off-road. Jeep is about the journey. Jeep has a great story. A story that I want to tell. I'm a voiceover talent, and I'm going off-road with a grassroots marketing campaign to voice for Jeep. Want to join me on the ride? I could sure use the company. Please tag Jeep. Post a link to kb4jeep.com. Add a message and use the hashtag MyJeepStory. Thanks, Jeep Talk Show and your listeners for your support along this crazy journey. See you on the social media trail. You're listening to Jeep Talk Show, the number one Jeep podcast. At my mom's house. Hey, coming up in Wrangler Talk, I'm going to be talking about the air in my tires again. <laughs> yeah, again. <laughs> it's it's going to be the uh, Tammy's white whale is going to be the t- air in the tires, and mine's uh-huh. going to be the, the heat the, creep on the highway, yep. <laughs> the engine overheating. <laughs> I think it's important. Uh, I think there, we actually, you actually, I said, I started to say we, you actually uh, hit upon a, a subject that a lot of people have uh, a lot of uh, things to say about uh, CPO or, or Chris, or I'm sure there's a third name we could call him, um, responded on uh, Facebook uh, about uh, listening to the post. Uh, I'm listening to the show and uh, he had some comments on it. I gave him a hard time about not calling in because uh, he was uh, specifically talking about the, the new call in show. Uh, that we had done and talking about uh, uh, tire uh, PSI. And uh, he said, well, I was listening to it this morning. And I went, oh, I didn't think about that. Sorry. <laughs> I, wish had, I wish he had called in, though. So, <laughs> Well, maybe he'll call in next week. Yeah, well, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if if, uh, if he's up and around at 8 p.m. on, on a Tuesday. Uh, he may have other things to do. But if you guys don't have anything else uh, better to do, that didn't sound right, uh, you should join us on the uh, Jeep Talk call-in show. Uh, 8 p.m. Tuesdays, uh, and uh, it's it's a little too early for Josh to to get home uh, from the West Coast. So it's just Tammy and I, and we're taking uh, calls from uh, you folks and uh, discussing uh, a subject that uh, we want to talk about, and then uh, 
After that, we talk about a subject that you want to talk about. So uh, uh, just join us every Tuesday night, 8 p.m. You can just go to jeeptalkshow.com and uh, watch, uh, chat, and call in. All righty. So uh, just want to uh, tell you guys, uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, which you, if you're watching us live, uh, or I guess if it's recorded, you're watching us on YouTube, we want you to know that the Jeep Talk Show is also available in audio-only format. Great to listen to while commuting or while working on your Jeep. Subscribe via iTunes, TuneIn, Google Play, or Stitcher. And uh, it hadn't happened yet, but we have submitted to iHeartRadio. We should be on there very soon. Uh, and you can never, uh, and you'll never miss an episode. All you have to do is press the little play button. So speaking of subscribing, you can now subscribe with your money. Oh, joy, you say. Yes, you can contribute directly to the show via PayPal. Just go to jeeptalkshow.com and look for the little orange button that says subscribe. And you can select 25 cents a week up to $1. Your account will be charged weekly. Cancel at any time. Even if you don't subscribe, we appreciate you taking time to listen to the show. Indeed. And hey, another way that you can subscribe. You're listening to a 4x4 four by four, four by four Radio Network Podcast. Sorry, Josh. You... No, that's my fault. You are indeed listening to a 4x4 Radio Network podcast, and just one of many, in fact. Uh, the Jeep Talk Show is a proud member of the 4x4 Radio Network. That's right. We are one of many. Just visit 4x4radionetwork.com and learn more about the 4x4 podcast, the Center Steer podcast, and even the Trail Chasers Talk podcast, all available on the 4x4 Radio Network uh, site, all in just one easy-to-use interface, guys. Head over there right now. Check it out, 4x4radionetwork.com. Shut up and listen. Shut up. Shut up. So shut up. You don't shut Man, up. Shut up, Shane. Hey. <laughs> shut up and listen. It's time for Wrangler Talk. It's time for G-Mama. So, yikes. Three shows in a row talking about my PSI. You kind of sound like Tony with his heat issues. <laughs> no, <laughs> no not, not, not menopause with Tony, but his, his Jeep. But anyway... So I'm still researching the right PSI for my tires, and it looks like 34, which I'm currently running, may still be a little high. Um, I was planning on calling Chuck, my guy at Adam's Extreme Shop today, but it was so up and down at work, I didn't have time. <laughs> oh, no. Um, <laughs> anyway, I've been searching the internet, asking fellow Jeepers, and it seems, it sounds like 25 to 30 might be the right PSI for me. So I plan on doing the chalk test again this weekend in and around my son's birthday events. Um and I if you guys don't mind, I was going to read CPO's little comment here on the Jeep Talk Show. Um, oh, all Facebook 17 site. pages of it? Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kidding. I'm kidding. It was no. very thorough. It even had, yeah, even and, had and, a picture. Um, it was CPO pressure. pressing, pointing at his tire. No, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. It's surprising <laughs> how little most folks actually know about this topic. I did a lot of research on this early on and considering doing a video at one point, but never found the time. The reality is we are putting tires on our Jeeps that are way too big for the application. Thus, we can't look at what the tire says, max pressure, or the Jeep says to determine what right pressure is for our vehicle. Tire pressure is about finding a balance that gets the most tread life, the best traction, handling, and yes, comfort is something to consider. Gas mileage, meh. When I drive a Jeep with 37 PSI and a set of 35s, because that's what the door says, that's what I was running at first, me, Jeep Mama, it feels like it wants to wander all over the road, and I personally found that to myself. When you go to a dealer or a shop, they will almost always fill them to whatever your vehicle says, not because that's the right pressure for your ride, but because it's the safe option from a liability perspective. It puts the burden back on you to deviate from that. Of course, there are folks that just don't know any better. Max tire pressure is a specific for max load. Well, 99% of the time, we are not putting max loads on our Jeeps. In fact, we are way underloaded for the typical 35 size application. And yes, there are differences between metric, P-metric, and flotation size tires. The differences are almost insig mostly insignificant for this discussion. On the flip side of that coin, the underinflated tires are nice and comfy, but at the cost of excessive heating, poor wear, poor handling, and yes, horrible rolling resistant and bas bad gas mileage. And he also posts an article, which I haven't read yet, which I will be reading. Um, but anyway, so a lot of people had a lot of comments um, in the chat room um, when 
Tony and I did our little call-in show Tuesday. Mm-hmm. Gave me lots of great information. Um, but I am going to move it down a couple PSI and do the chalk test again. It, it'll be interesting to compare. But I'll keep you guys posted. Please do. And if anyone else has any information that you'd like to share, I'd like to hear from you. Just email me, email me at info at jeeptalkshow.com and use the subject line Wrangler Talk. So uh, I think we mentioned this on the, the Tuesday night show, Tammy, or I think I mentioned this to you. I've heard of a, uh, a water test where you can drive through water and just look at the pattern that way. Uh, I yeah. don't know if, if one's better than the other, but I know it'd be a lot simpler to do the, uh, the, oh, the water, the water test, test. Yeah, than, it would. than the chalk test. And, Maybe uh, we'll do water this time. Yeah, I mean, well, I guess it's, it's not good to change the way you measure you know, it's good to measure the same way for every this, time. Yeah, I was going to say for the sake of right, consistency comparison, and comparison yeah. purposes, you make sure you, you do the test the same way you did before. But, you know, you could always switch and then you know, switch to something else. Or you guys that maybe haven't ever done the, the chalk test could uh, do the water test instead. Now, don't try it on a rainy day. I'll tell you yeah, that much. I, it just won't, it won't work on a rainy <laughs> Or day. in too deep of water. Yeah, or too deep of water. <laughs> Unless you got a snorkel. Just throw out the obvious here. <laughs> Unless you got a snorkel. Yeah. <laughs> so, there you go. Hey, what do those treads look like back there? <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I, I lost cousin Frank while checking my tire pressure. <laughs> here, put on this life vest. Why? We're going to check my tread. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you listen to the Jeep Talk Show? What are you talking about, man? Where do you listen to the Jeep Talk Show? I got no idea what the heck. Where do you listen to the Jeep Talk Show at? Get out of my face, yo. Hey, where do you listen to the Jeep Talk Show at? Underwater. Hey, where do you listen to the Jeep Talk Show at? In the bubble bath. Where do you listen to the Jeep Talk Show at? No clue. And where do you listen to the Jeep Talk Show at? While flexing on stumps. Where do you listen to the Jeep Talk Show at? Hey, where do you listen to the Jeep Talk Show at? Hey, where do you listen to the Jeep Talk Show at? I would assume on the radio. The Jeep Talk Show, available on iTunes and at jeeptalkshow.com. Hey, where do you listen to the Jeep Talk Show at? Let us uh, know. Give us a call at 530-675-4102 and tell us where you listened to the Jeep Talk Show at. So, um, you know, I don't know if you guys are aware of it, but Facebook now allows you to do reviews and we, I really wasn't aware of it until we started seeing reviews pop up on the Jeep talk show Facebook page. And, uh, they allow you to do, you know, stars one through five. And, uh, we have some reviews tonight from Facebook. Way cool. Yeah, it is. So it uh, looks like uh, this first one is from uh, Jason, uh, I'm going to say Galbo, gave us five stars. I've listened to 40 episodes in the last two weeks. God bless you. <laughs> it makes great food for thought when you're going through the motion of my 14-hour work day and puts yeah. a positive spin on my day. Shout out to Tony, Josh, and Tammy for putting in the time. It, it is truly appreciated. Thank you very much, Jason. And a very big salute to you for the 14 hours a day. Yeah, definitely. Well, this one comes from Nicholas Tudich. Boy, I'm sure I'm butchering that one. He gave us a five-star review as well. Hey, guys and gal, this is Alabama EMT. I'm the guy who just got his first Jeep, and your show had a bit to do with that. Well, that's way cool. This review was read on episode 233. I told my friend I would reference his amazing deal on his latest Jeep. We picked up an XJ with around twelve, uh, with around 120,000 miles and a four liter with a manual transmission. He paid $1 for the Jeep and we drove it <laughs> onto the trailer. The previous owner wanted it out of her yard because it was leaking oil. Turns out it was a bad sending unit and replaced it for around 35 bucks. The TJ is a 1999 Sport with an automatic and the four, line, uh, four liter inline six. It only has about 75,000 original miles. The previous owner added 15 inch Mickey Thompson bullet hole wheels and Max's 311050 Bighorn tires. This Jeep is my daily driver, and I've been going to my local off-road park and have been amazed at how capable a stock TJ really is. I'm not new to off-roading. Mud riding is where I'm from. It's sort of a rite of passage. I plan on adding a 3.5-inch lift and 35-inch tires at some point in the next two years. I'm looking for a winch as well. I also just bought a second-hand tube front bumper and a bull bar. Your show is so full of information and for new and experienced Jeepers alike. Thanks for the information, and I listen to the JTS everywhere I have cell service. Nick T. So I'll Thanks, just Nick. I'll just awesome. mention yeah I'll just mention really quick that uh, Tammy found out firsthand that a a stock Jeep uh, wheels very well whenever she went wheeling with Nate. 
Yeah, yes. no, definitely. Uh, <laughs> his, I don't think, is quite stock. No, but, uh, that's the day. Yeah, no, no, he's, he's in the chat room tonight. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, oh, we the have fun doesn't five... end there. We've got another one here, Tammy. Yep, another five stars from Ted McAfee. The Jeep Talk Show is a great place to hear all things about Jeep. Tammy, Tony, and Josh have fun with the info and will and with all the listeners. Keep up the good work, PA Jeep Freak. Now, he hasn't been in the the chat room here the last couple of shows. I don't think he's in there tonight either. I did see him in there, there tonight. So, did he? Yeah, oh, okay, good. Because uh, I was going to require a note around. if he uh, wasn't here tonight. <laughs> You need to be in there, young man. So, (laughs) from the Twitterverse, we've got swbcrawler.com at swbcrawler. Congrats to at Jeep Talk Show on their success reported in episode 239. Nice work with an exclamation point. And if you guys don't know, that's all, that's Nate as well. Yes. David Gray at Jeep in Veteran. Okay. Hashtag Jeep family. What would you say is the best all rounded 37 inch tire? Disney is calling. (laughs) Smiley face. <laughs> Don't get the Disney reference. <laughs> Man, in the in the 37 inch uh range, I really like the Goodyears. Uh the Kevlar in that size oh, has yeah. an amazingly strong sidewall, especially in like the D or E rated size. Um th- those are those kind of tires where even without bead locks, you can take them down to to five PSI or under and really not be too worried about it. I don't know what kind of terrain you got in your neck of the woods, but if you're around a lot of rocks or trees or stuff like that, uh, I definitely go with with the Kevlar's. They are a good all around tire, and they uh, do quite well over in King of the Hammers. So uh, if they're placing consistently in the top five, I would say that's a good tire to have on your Jeep as well. And I'll just mention uh, the 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 Twitter name is Jeeping Veteran. So you probably know this, but for anybody else that is going, ooh, thirty seven's got to have them. There's a lot of things that you have to do to your rig to handle 37 yes. inch tires because the yes, additional indeed. weight oh, yeah. and torque and everything else. So yeah, if it's, if it's driving down the road every day to work, yep. You can put 37s on there. You may, you still may need to re gear, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you can get up to 300 miles an hour on a highway. Uh, yeah, we but, could spend a, a whole, yeah. a whole episode just on tire selection for, you know, what kind of wheeling you do and, and all that sort of stuff. Maybe one of these days we'll do, we'll, we'll yeah. dedicate a good chunk of a, of a, uh, of a show to just tire talk. But anyway, just don't think you can throw some 37s on there. There's a lot more work you got to do. And now something we all look forward to each and every week, and that's hearing from the mind of Nikki G. Oh, and by the way, we got to hear him live yeah. Tuesday night. That was pretty oh, exciting. Oh, he called in. The right mind on. of yeah. Nikki G. Hey, this is Nikki G. And uh, just got back from our Canadian vacation. And sorry to say I couldn't catch up with Clyde or Tommy. When I was up there, uh, my goal was to look for two drunk guys, (laughs) which uh, trying to find a drunk guy in Canada is like trying to find a lonely teenager in a Darth Vader costume at a Comic-Con convention. Uh Uh, If you ever get a chance to go to Canada, I recommend it. Uh, Once you get outside of the city, the rolling farmlands, it's just beautiful. kind of reminds you of uh, Minnesota without the super croc. And uh, we were up in Quebec, so they speak French, which was a lot easier to understand than Super Croc. No. Yeah, moving along. Uh, Josh, a couple episodes ago, you were talking about force flashing the computer in the Jeep, and you said it was so easy, even Nikki G can do it. And I decided to test that theory. Long story short, my local fire department has a seven-minute response time. Which is two minutes faster than the last time. All right, guys and girls, I'll uh, chat you later. You have a good one. Bye. <laughs> oh, I knew it. I knew I was asking for trouble when I threw him under the bus like that. But uh, no, it's all all about love, guy. All about love. Uh, we uh, we have fun over here. So speaking of uh, uh, Clyde and Tommy, I, f- I forgot about this. Uh, I was uh, I uh, record the outrageous acts of science uh, show on the uh, Science Channel. I think that's mm-hmm. right. And uh, I saw Clyde and Tommy on Outrageous Acts of Science last night. I saw that on their Facebook page. No. Yep, yep. So they were, uh, if you guys uh, record that or, you know, they, it's, uh, it's cable, so you see it 27,000 times. Look for Garage Geniuses number 19 and you will see, um, <laughs> well, Tommy cooking his wiener. Uh <laughs> <laughs> 
they uh, they were uh, in one of their videos. They show this uh, this tool. It's an induction tool that you can oh, use yeah. to heat up I bolts the video and stuff. They did of that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, in that, because uh, they always have a humorous side to their video, one of the things they did was cook a hot dog on a metal skewer with this uh, bolt removal tool. And uh, Tommy ate it. And uh, I had asked them uh, in uh, in chat one day, "Is Tommy still pooping out uh, metal bits?" And he was. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god <laughs> yeah it doesn't it wasn't a good hot dog no matter what you hear on the video or uh, on yeah. the outrageous acts of science it wasn't <laughs> a good hot dog <laughs> but it was pretty cool so anyway uh yeah, yeah it wasn't cooked all the way through no yeah well what hot dog is really. but i'm bum yeah uh, that, that was bad <laughs> <laughs> i got it but it did have a hole in the middle all the way through <clears throat> so uh, anyway, that way we uh, can uh, segue into something else very quickly. So anyway, let me uh, get over here and press this button. You got tech questions? Ah, oh, what do I ever? We have answers. Oh, that's good. I can, I, it's Tech Talk with Jeep Talk. Yahoo! Well, Rick from Ohio has written us uh, via email, and that is to info at jeeptalkshow.com. He says, I just got this from Blackstone Labs. I'm on their email list as I have my Jeep's oil tested to be warned of any problems that an oil test can provide. Thought I would send this along to you as it says in their comments that, quote, this is a common weakness in the four liter engines, unquote. Blackstone Labs does, a, does lots of oil tests and I'm sure this info is something that you may want to pass on to the four liter engine owners out there. Hope this is helpful. Thanks, Rick. Well, thank you, Rick. Very much appreciate you sending in the uh, sending in the letter. Now, what he sent along with this was a picture of a report from a complete breakdown of all the things this lab is looking for and that could pop up in any oil test of this caliber. Now, the procedures are somewhat proprietary to each laboratory, but let's just say this. It's a lot more involved than Bubba Joe sticking his fingers in your fill hole and sniffing what, what he pulls out. What hole? Think, <laughs> things like the levels of sodium, calcium, and potassium or for more familiar things to an engine like iron, copper, aluminum, and nickel. But they don't stop there. Along with a whole slew of other items, labs like Blackstone will tell you that the flash point of your, what, your, what the flash point of your oil is, meaning at what point it will ignite and start smoking, uh, its viscosity levels, as well as the amount of water and antifreeze that could be lurking in the lube. Obviously, an analysis like this isn't something that every vehicle owner should concern themselves with, but... The comment from Blackstone about a common problem with the four liters had me digging deeper. In the case of the report that Rick sent me about a 2000 Wrangler TJ with just a touch over 300,000 miles on it, there were very high levels of potassium and sodium in the oil, which is a dead giveaway that this Jeep has major antifreeze problems. That's a common weakness of these four liter engines, they said. Antifreeze tends to start finding its way into the oil around 100,000 miles. Now that's pretty true. 100,000 miles is a good indicator that, well, there might be some headwork in the future. And that's what you're seeing here. In the case of this 2000 TJ, the head gasket has failed to some extent and is allowing coolant into the oil supply. Well, what will a few parts per million do for you, you might ask? Well, in this case, it's a lot more than just a few drops of sweet green antifreeze. Any amount of water or coolant in your oil does several bad things. Coolant destroys the oil's ability to lubricate, causing poor wear throughout the engine, but especially at the bearings, which is where we will see the higher levels of copper, lead, and tin in the oil. And the shafts and the other cast parts that can break down as well, and we'll see higher levels of iron when those start to go. Coolant also thickens the viscosity of oil, and not in a good way. It causes sludge and other insolubles to build up so the oil doesn't circulate as freely. Bottom line, there is excessive antifreeze in the oil tested from this Wrangler, and its engine needs help. Pronto. If you have a high-mileage Jeep and it's never had a rebuild, looking into having a lab like Blackstone test a sample of your oil it might be a good idea the very least it will give you a better understanding of what's going on inside the block. Thanks again, Rick, for the tip, and hopefully info like this will be of some good use to some of our fellow Jeepers out there. And hey, Jeepers, let me know if you guys have a tech question you would like answered here on the Jeep Talk Show. Just shoot me an email to info at jeeptalkshow.com with the subject line, Tech Talk. Excellent. Man, I, you know, I'm looking forward to an oil analyzing app for my phone. That would oh, be just a, a little litmus strip that you plug into your USB and dip it in your, you know, valve cover or something like that. Yeah, I'm, sure. I'm thinking tricorder <laughs> where you just. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> ah, okay. Yeah, it looks pretty good. So, Tammy, did you understand what we were talking about there or what uh, Josh was talking about there? Not really. So, basically, uh, that oil test uh, allows them to see if there's any freeze in the oil 
which or is, which any is, other things that should be there. Thing. Yeah, which is a bad thing. Or the parts of the bearings, pieces, small debris of the bearings. That are we are talking oil. microscopic here. Yes. I mean, uh, obviously, if you've got ball bearings floating around in your oil, floating, uh, <laughs> as moving around in your oil in there, in big chunks of metal, you have serious engine problems, and you probably aren't even driving the Jeep around at that point anyways. But no, this is more than just a little bit of glitter in the oil here, guys. Mm-hmm. The, the, they are taking this down to a molecular level. And, and this is, for all intents and purposes, a full baseline spectroanalysis of what is in oil, or at least in the oil that you're sending them. So um, they look for pretty much anything and everything that can and will pop up in motor oil. And, and they will give you a very detailed report of what, you know, what those numbers are. And, and uh, of course, taking something like that to a professional mechanic will help you diagnose what potential problems might be lurking. Yeah, knowing yeah that's what I was thinking that the benefit of that would be. Yeah, knowing what's in the oil gives you an indication of what kind of uh, problems you may be having. Unless you have had a slew of problems and, and you're still not even to 100,000 miles yet, I, I, I wouldn't say this is, is, is for you. If you're over 100,000 miles and um, the Jeep may have had some, uh, a few owners maybe has seen a, a, a few times of some hard wheeling, it might not be a bad idea to just give yourself a baseline measurement. Maybe do this once a year if you're over a hundred thousand miles, or or uh, you know your Jeep sees a lot of um, sees a lot of use. Might be a good idea to just get yourself a baseline measurement of what's going on inside that engine. I would say if it's been overheated, uh, if the engine uh-huh. has been over uh, severely overheated, especially, it would be a, a real good way of seeing if you had any uh, head warp. Uh, issues because it would That's be right. coolant in the oil. So yeah, combine this with a uh, something like a, um, a like a leak down test or mm-hmm. even a compression test will give you a very good understanding of what's happening inside that engine. Yeah, I don't know how much this thing costs, but boy, just getting some oil and sending it off to a lab and waiting for the reports sounds a whole lot, whole hell of a lot cooler during the summertime heat than going out there and doing stuff yourself. <laughs> and a lot more fun than a Mori Povich test. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> I love that show. <laughs> hey guys, you know, just like we heard from Who? Rick from Ohio via email, we love hearing from you too. So be sure and call our voicemail at 530-675-4102 or you can jump over to our website, jeeptalkshow.com and leave us a message. Just click on the leave voicemail button. Hey, this is Tony. And I'm Tammy. And this is Josh. And you've reached our 24-7 voicemail line. You guys know what to do, so at the beep, leave your message. Hey, guys. It's uh, Jason from Oregon Trail Off-Road calling you from uh, the middle of nowhere in Wyoming. <laughs> we are currently oh, in the car, windows rolled up, no air conditioning, and it is halfway through our expedition. Uh, and we've uh, had a good time so far making it through uh, Wyoming. I think aside from Oregon, this is probably our favorite state collectively. And uh, we're down one, guys. Zach had to go home, so it's just the four of us, Chris, Kobe, Wilkie, and Jason, myself. And uh, we're cruising into Casper, Wyoming, to uh, refuel and resupply. And then we're going to hop back on the trail and try to make our way into Nebraska. So uh, we're having a blast. No issues with the truck so far, knock on wood. And we've seen a lot of beautiful scenery and met a lot of cool people. So we're enjoying ourselves and uh, making it through the Oregon Trail. Uh, let's talk to you guys again, and we'll uh, talk to you next time. You know, there is a little-known local ordinance in Casper that you cannot make any friendly ghost jokes. Oh, jeez. <laughs> a timely reference, Josh? Timely, yes. <laughs> it's great hearing from you guys. Thank you very much. I know that that's... Uh, uh, what an exciting trip. Yeah, I know that's got to be a a, a a pit of a pain having to call in, but we sure do appreciate it. We like knowing where you are and how it's going, and sorry that you uh, you lost a man. Um, so, Well, they are over 1,000 miles from home, uh, uh, well over 1,000 miles from home, uh, and that's pretty much by the way the crow flies. You know, road miles, it's a lot more than that. These guys are definitely a, a long trip away from home, and, and halfway through – their journey backtracking the Lewis and Clark Trail, uh, staying off road as much as possible. Sounds like these guys are are both making history and having fun as well. I'm gonna have to send them a message and ask them for uh, UFO reports. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. I'm sure uh, you know way away from the city lights yes. and, and out in the middle of the country, 
Uh, some of those starscapes are just absolutely amazing at night. Now they have sent us in some uh, some great images from uh, off off the oh yeah the tra- on the trail and off the beaten path. Yeah, and, there was uh, uh, there was one picture they sent in uh, where they were kind of uh, camped out next to this little rock outcropping that kind of kind of you know was uh, had this little half circle dig into the to the face of a of a hillside or a mountain or something like that. And I was thinking to myself, that is just the coolest camping site ever. Yeah. Um, looking out over these high plains, and it was just absolutely remarkable. But we'll have those for you in uh, upcoming reports from Oregon Trail Off Road. Just wanted to uh, let you know, and them, since uh, we didn't use it tonight. Now let's get over to uh, our next caller. Hey guys, it's Nate. Uh, just I'm in the middle of your uh, second episode where you're addressing Ron's voicemail about uh, the 3.6 liter. Uh, Jeep Pentastar or Chrysler Pentastar or whatever. Um, I just wanted to sort of, I don't know, weigh in a little bit on the 4.0 versus the 3.8 versus the 3.6. Uh, so first of all, like you guys have mentioned, the 3.6 is a relatively new engine, and uh, I just don't think that there are that there's enough of them on the road for the uh, the longevity that you've seen with the 4.0. So nobody knows if we're going to get 300,000 miles out of them. Maybe we will. Maybe we won't. Uh, I can say that the 2011 and 12 and even some of the 13s had head problems and cylinder problems, so you definitely want to avoid them uh, unless you have some proof that they've been through the various uh, repairs that have fixed the, the head problems and cylinder wall problems that they had. Uh, as far as the 3.6 versus the 4.0, uh, the 4.0, I'm not going to lie, is an awesome motor. Um, I've driven several 4.0s, and I've seen them last even in my own personal use, up to 200,000 miles, and then uh, the, the vehicles were sold and still in use today, as far as I know. Uh, but the one thing that the 3.6 does have over the 4.0 is efficiency. Uh, I mean, the, the 2013 JK that I was driving for a year and a half or two years got a good uh, 5 to 10 miles per gallon better than the LJ that I'm driving now, which has the 4.0 in it. So keep that in mind when you're when you're thinking about Comparing the two, uh, I will agree that the 3.8 is generally viewed as a bad choice. Uh, I do know a guy that loves the 3.8, and he insists that it's just as good as the 3.6. I don't know. I've never owned one. Um, so, uh, also, I see absolutely no reason to try to talk somebody out of a hard top. I do love a soft top. I've driven soft top Jeeps forever, and uh, I even had a hard top on my 13, and I took it off and sold it, traded it for a soft top. But uh, to each their own. You know, if you want a hard top, buy a hard top. They're awesome. I mean, you can take out those freedom panels and get some uh, get some sun, and you get the security of the hard top, uh, be that as it may. So, um, yeah, uh, hope this helps you out. Thanks. Great engine information. Uh, thank you, Nate. And I agree with you. Uh, you should get exactly what it is that you want to get. It's your money. It's your life, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I... I just can't help but thinking you've got a, a, a vehicle, a very unique vehicle uh, that you can uh, drive around without the top on and you're limiting your ability to do it with a hard top. Doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means you need more equipment or friends to, in time <laughs> to, to turn it in from uh, a uh, enclosed uh, vehicle to a open air vehicle. Hey, real quick, um, I, I was going to save this for our next show, but I think this is as good as time as any to uh, to read this. We had a uh, response um, uh, to uh, s- some stuff that we had going on in episode two thirty nine uh, and previous shows, uh, t- really about the th- about these engines, three six and three eight, and specifically about um, about a gentleman who called in asking our opinions about kind of which direction to go as far as a new Jeep goes. And really quickly, this is from uh, from Rick M. He says, uh, I, have, uh, I have some comments about the fellow in Arizona that called in asking in for info on the 3.6 liter engine as he wants to buy a new Jeep and wants to make sure it will last. I hate to say this, but it was like listening to the old joke about someone asking what time it is and getting the answer about how to build a watch. Here's a guy wanting to buy a new vehicle for he and his wife to use as they get older and doesn't want to worry about it breaking down and leaving them stranded. And you guys tell him to buy an older Jeep as they are dependable and easier to fix. Tell him to buy the new Jeep, and if he has any problems, he will have a warranty that will cover it. If he's really worried about it, he can buy a lifetime warranty from, uh, for the Jeep from Jeep. There's always the option to drop in a V8 uh, if, it, uh, if, it's about, if the engine fails and the warranty doesn't cover it. My wife and I are in our 60s and just bought a new 2016 JKU Rubicon Hard Rock and 
plan to make this vehicle last 10 plus years, and for us, it was about having a new vehicle that would not need repairs that would leave us stranded. I would suggest that the Arizona guy reconsider his desire to get the stick shift. If he plans to make this vehicle last well into their golden years, he needs to think about how they are going to shift it if they have a knee or foot problems as they age. And if they have had an automatic transmission, this would not be a problem. JK forums that are out there do not mention any problems with the auto transmission that I have read, but do not, but do mention some slight problems with the standard transmission. So this also should be looked into as he makes his decision. I enjoy the show and must say that I started listening to hear Jeep Mama and her Wrangler talk as <laughs> I too have a Wrangler and I'm soon going to add lift and tires to mine as well. Looking forward to the next one. Thanks. Rick M. I'm glad you read that, Josh. I was, uh, uh, as I was listening to the, the voicemail, I went, oh, we got a great email in about that that had, yeah, a, I remember had that. a great exactly. point. Yeah, that, and I was, those bells were ringing in my ears as well. And so. I was going to scramble to find it, but I just I just couldn't with everything going on. So I'm really glad you pulled that up. And uh, because the I don't agree with the uh, uh, with Rick on the, um, the older Jeep thing. It's relative to how well it's built and the longevity of the 4.0 and the transmission i think that even though it's an older jeep i think it will be more reliable than the newer jeep based on what information i've read not personal experience but i do agree with you and i had not considered about the older uh the older people having problems with their feet and knees and joints and uh, having to use that standard transmission and i thought that was a a great point uh, and uh, really appreciate that uh, that uh, email that you had sent in, sent into us, so we could uh, share that with Ron. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, thanks Rick M for sending that in. Appreciate the interaction. And I believe he's in our chat room tonight as well. Oh, very good. So let's uh, speaking of Ron, we got another call from Ron. Let's see what Ron has to say. Hey guys, this is Ron in Arizona. Uh, you had a great show tonight. I really appreciate you addressing the issue that I have with the 3.6. You've answered a lot of questions for me. It's been very helpful. I really do appreciate it. You guys were talking about tire pressure. <laughs> <laughs> the numbers on the side of the tire are there by the manufacturer, and they have to do that by law because based upon the way that they place the steel in the tire and the steel in the sidewall, that is the maximum allowable tire pressure uh, for that tire uh, 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 because if you exceed that, you risk the chance of blowing out the tire. That's why that's there. It's maximum allowable. But then the tires are shipped to the manufacturer because the or the vehicle manufacturer, because the manufacturer who built the tire doesn't know how the tire is going to be used in the real world. <clears throat> That's why there's a sticker on the door frame. The engineers who designed the vehicles know what the loading is per axle and per point on the car. That's why the federal law requires them to put that sticker in the door frame to tell the consumer how much air has to be in those tires to properly carry the load. That, again, is required by law. Now, as far as tire pressure, whenever you change the original equipment and that door sticker no longer applies, I've always used the water test. And it's a lot like if you can imagine a rubber stamp and a, a little ink pad. Is If you have a clean piece of concrete and you just create a puddle of water with a bucket of water and you drive through it, just for a few feet, then you can get out and look and see at what kind of stamp the tread is making on that concrete in the wet. It'll make a perfect stamp of your tread pattern. And you can adjust your tire pressure accordingly so that you get a real nice perfect stamp of that tire pattern on the concrete in the fresh water. After you drive through a little water puddle, you get the idea. Just make sure that you don't get too close to what is on the sidewall. As an example, if you have a big, heavy truck, it's got a big diesel engine in the front, you'll see tire pressures that say 70 in the front and 50 in the rear because there's not as much weight back there. And you have to have those pressures. But if you have a door sticker that says 70 PSI, 
and that's what you're running, and the sidewall of the tire says 70 PSI, you bought the wrong tire. You need a tire if you have to run. And Ron hit the three-minute mark. Oh, poor Ron. <laughs> so just as a reminder. I wonder how long he, went, he kept going before he realized. I think it, I think it tells you whenever, whenever you're done. Uh, but just a reminder, when you call into our voicemail, it's three minutes max. So get you a nice egg timer and uh, turn it over whenever you're uh, getting ready to start talking. But nonetheless, Ron, thank you very much for the yeah, uh, for the uh, the breakdown there. He did a really good job there of explaining the water mm-hmm. method for determining the proper tire pressure in your Jeeps. Yep, and we hope that the, yeah, and we hope the comments uh, that were made tonight uh, help you with uh, your decision. And please let us know what your final uh, purchase is on that Jeep and uh, the, the all the amenities that you get with it. It's hard top, soft top, standard, automatic. Uh, let us know if we screwed up your plan or not. <laughs> <laughs> Don't listen to us. Yeah, you do what you want to do. We're just going to, you know, it's not our money. So uh, anyway, let's get over to our uh, our next uh, voicemail. Hey, guys, it's Nate again. Turns out that episode 239 is just chock full of topics that I feel compelled to call you guys. Uh, that's great. So this time I want to talk about the Curry Anti-Rock that uh, you guys talked about in your campfire side chat. Oh, good. Tony, you absolutely need one of these things. In fact, <laughs> all of you absolutely need one of these things. Even you, Tammy, you don't need that that fancy disconnect system, which is prone to failure. What you need is a Curry Anti-Rock. The cool thing about the Anti-Rock is, uh, as Josh was talking about, it uses, uh, I believe the correct term is a torsion bar in between the two two arms on the end of the sway bar, which basically allows the whole link to twist around instead of being solid like the factory sway bar. The big difference between that and disconnects, aside from the fact that you don't have to crawl underneath your Jeep and connect and uh, disconnect them whenever you're on or off-road, is that um, it actually works in opposition to the rear sway bar that's uh, that's all on the back of the Wranglers, and I bel- I'm not sure if the Cherokee has one of them or not. If it doesn't, then uh, maybe this isn't as as cool for you Cherokee owners. But on the Wrangler, the rear sway bar, which you don't usually disconnect, uh, also twists. So the Curry Anti Rock oh, will actually nice. work in opposition of that. Uh, making the flex of the suspension actually a little bit uh, more uh, level, I guess you want to call it. So with the front sway bar absolutely disconnected, the front will sway or the front will will articulate until the rear is forced to articulate. And the, since the, the rear has force opposing it and the front doesn't, the front will generally articulate more. You get uneven flex out of it. Uh, that includes, I believe, the Rubicon's automatic disconnect system that they have in there. Uh, with the anti-rock, since the two oppose each other, you end up, uh, you know, when your front right tire raises, your your rear left tire will uh, also raise at the same the same uh, pressure, or whatever you want to call it. So anyway, I have one on the LJ. That's probably where Tammy heard about it. Maybe uh, I'm wrong, but I think I showed it to her when she was up at uh, AOAA with me. Um, it's a great mod, and it's about twice the price of the uh, JKS disconnects, but I think it's worth every single penny. It's a great upgrade. All right. Uh, talk to you guys later. Thanks. Bye. It was uh, you that mentioned it, wasn't it, Josh? Yeah, it was. And uh, I've wheeled with a lot of guys that would say the same thing that this guy is, that they love it and that you need it for your Jeep. And they do make it for virtually every Jeep platform out there, so uh, both front and rear. So, Josh, maybe you know the answer to this. Uh, on in, in Tammy's situation where she has front and rear sway bars, uh, and, yes. and no, the, the uh, Cherokees do not. Um, the, uh, could you get, uh, get it just for the rear sway bar? You could. Um, and I, I have seen that set up, but really you'd almost be better running this in the, in the front and nothing in the rear. Well, I mean, Uh, she has the disconnect already in the front and, uh, but she has no way of, of disconnecting the rear. So I was thinking this is what, really, what I was saying is leave the rear completely disconnected altogether and just run this up front. Well, you don't want to be, you don't want, you, you need a sway bar in the rear. Don't no, you? you don't actually. Oh, on the, on the, uh, I thought with the coils that you needed that additional, you don't need it. And especially in, in the, in the rear of something like a Wrangler, um, it, it just, unless you running, uh, running a lot of weight, you regularly tow, um, you see very fast freeway my, uh, freeway speeds. It's really not not as as useful or as as used in in the control of the suspension as as you'd think. So this and, would be, and having it not there to begin with 
is a benefit off road because oh, yeah. <clears throat> excuse I mean one you don't even have to you know climb underneath the jeep to mess with it but two uh, you know it, you get that articulation out of the rear the way that it should yeah and now uh, would you say that uh, I know that uh, a lot of Cherokee owners run around uh, without a sway bar uh, so you know it, it's just like driving a big old boat uh, would you say that this is more or less dangerous for a Wrangler to run around without a sway bar or have it connected in the rear Again, it kind of depends on what kind of driving style that you have. If if you are into jackrabbit starts, you are into consistently twenty miles over the speed limit. Um, if you drive very aggressively, well, this sounds like you, Tammy. Then, don't drive aggressively. Then, then you know maybe <laughs> not. But you know, again, I you know I deal with a lot of guys that that just don't run anything sway sway bar in the rear. Now the front is another story. Uh, because you know, that's, that's where all your handling is really coming from. Mm -hmm. Um, that's, what's going to react first, um, when you have to jerk the wheel one way or the other. Now, yeah, you are going to feel a little bit more body roll. You're going to feel a little bit more sway. Um, but is it going to be like, Oh my God, I'm going to tip off the side of the freeway. No, it's not going to be like that at all. And in fact, it, you'll eventually get, get used to it quite a, quite a bit. Now, is that going to be the, would the same apply to running no sway bars at all? That I would definitely not recommend. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure from a liability standpoint that we weren't directing people towards, um, you know, a rollover. So that's the reason why I'm, I, I asked the question as far as the danger goes. Uh, it's, it's, it's a good idea to have your sway bars uh, connected. If you disconnect them, make sure that you're fully informed and uh, you uh, drive appropriately so you don't kill yourself. Good call. We, we well, I can tell you one thing when I, um, when I push my sway bar button, and then if I go back into, you know, just regular driving, um, it the Jeep automatically reconnects everything, even if I forget to push the button. Well, aren't you special, Princess? I know. <laughs> <laughs> Again, thank you very much for all your calls tonight and uh, great information. I think we got uh, almost as much tech talk in our, our voicemails that we yeah. had in the show and just love yeah, that's that. That's great. Yeah. All right, let's get over to Jeep Cherokee from Stock to Wheeler. We haven't done this uh, for a, a couple episodes, and uh, it's summertime. Uh, it's uh, getting close to being over, but uh, depending where you are, it's going to be uh, warm for uh, a good month and a half longer, maybe even two months. So we're going to call this one Hot and Bothered. Recently, a Jeep brother shared his uh, story of running hot on the highway in his Jeep Cherokee. One of the disadvantages to modifying our Cherokee is the additional stress on the engine and its cooling system. You need, to, uh, you need adequate coolant. Nothing will cool better than water, but water will rust inside your motor and make a mess clogging up your radiator. So use a good coolant additive like Prestone. I personally don't see any sense in buying 50-50 mix. I have, wa <laughs> I have a water hose. I can add water anytime I like. Uh, next, you want to be sure your cooling system is holding the correct pressure. For my 1998 uh, Jeep Cherokee, it means a 16 PSI radiator cap. Uh, other things in your cooling system can cause pressure loss, including a marginal heater core. Uh, don't forget about that because that is part of your cooling system. Uh, what if you've done everything and you're still having issues? Well, get a better measuring device. That OEM gauge and sensor is crap. After a long battle with running hot on the highway, I purchased an engine watchdog TM1, a digital temp monitor with an alarm. I bolted it to the thermostat housing, ran the cable inside to the cab to the meter, and now I can monitor the uh, engine tipper temp in two ways. If you're interested in getting one of those little things or learning more about it, just go to enginewatchdog.com, and uh, they have several models. I got the cheapest one, uh, which is around 100 bucks. Uh, it is the TM1. Uh, it's Tango, uh, uh, Mexico, the number one. And uh, they are in Australia, so if you order one, make sure you tell them Fahrenheit, unless you like the Celsius crap. So, uh, well, where did that go wrong? Let me know uh, or add to what I've said. Just email me at info at jeeptalkshow.com with stock to Wheeler in the subject line. Josh, what did I miss? I mean, there's a lot more to the cooling well, system than what I went through. Don't use your hose. Use distilled water. I've heard that. So, I've never done so, that. So yeah. that's what Steve says, 4.3. Yeah. yeah, you don't get the impurities. You, you don't. It, it's, yeah, they're just distilled water. That's that. Don't drink it. Uh, it tastes it funny. Radiator. <laughs> it tastes funny. I can I can uh, use the uh, the iron. I'll pour it out of the iron into the Jeep uh, cooling system. Yep. Uh, it's it's probably not a bad idea. I guess that keeps the uh, the 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 muck and stuff from developing inside the cooling system. 
Is that yeah, correct? Yeah, definitely. Um, <laughs> you know, that making sure that if you do use um, a, a coolant, uh, that it's the right kind of coolant. There are some that will uh, start breaking down other components in the in the system, including parts of the engine. You definitely don't want to do that. So make sure you're running the the right kind of uh, antifreeze or coolant in your in your system. Um, something else that if you've done some work to anything, like maybe recently you replaced a thermostat or maybe you have done something like a heater core, um, do something like, you know, making sure you've burped your system. Uh, you get an air bubble that's trapped in the cooling system somewhere that can cause you a lot of grief as well. So uh, there are lots of tutorials online of how to do this, depending on whether or not you have an open or a closed system. And again, it would take a too much. It would take more time than we have right now to go through both of those procedures. But uh, maybe that's something that we can do on, on a future episode as well. Yep, yep. So anyway, uh, just uh, make sure that you've got proper pressure and proper coolant. and Oh, and put some water in that overflow bottle while you're at it so uh, it can suck it back in whenever your engine cools off. All right, well, let's get over to your must-have stuff for your Jeep. And, so Tammy's, um, Tammy's got one great item yeah. here for us this week. Uh, this one stood out above all the rest. Tammy, what do we got this week? And this one goes out to Ron, too, if you decide to buy that hard top. Um, Jeep Wrangler hard top and door removal toolkit. I got mine as a free gift when I um, bought my Rubicon. But this handy little kit from Mopar contains the most used tool bits for simple and easy fix jobs for your JK Wrangler. Quickly remove your doors, your hard top, soft top, battery terminals, and so much more. When I um, had to put on my off-road lights, um, I was able to use this little ratchet. They also has a 10 millimeter socket, a T30, a T40, a T50 Torx bits, along with instructions on how to remove your doors and roof. It is a handy little tool that you can put right in your glove box. And you can find it on Amazon if you go to, let's see, where is it? JeepTalkShow.com slash Amazon. Oh, That'd be the link you're looking How for. How dare you, Tammy? I know. If it were a snake, <laughs> you should include that in your nightly prayers. I, I know. <laughs> All right, well, let's get over to uh, Campfire Side Chat. Ah, that fire feels nice. Nice and warm. <laughs> Hot, some might say. Yeah, it's starting to get chilly here. <laughs> oh, that's nice. <laughs> well, it's in the 80s. Well, that's, I wouldn't mind that. Of that of the 90s. Wouldn't mind that at all. So my oil pressure saga has continued. I um, uh -huh. uh, recently uh, got a mechanical gauge on my Jeep and have confirmed that I do have nice, strong oil pressure, even at idle. Like 180 and PSI or something. It's like that, huge. No, it's it's huge. 60, 60 plus. <laughs> uh, 60 plus at idle. And it really only briefly goes up to um, uh, maybe 70 something uh, when I rev the engine and, and whatnot. But uh and that's even after um, it gets nice and warm. Uh, so I, I know that I'm doing just fine on the oil pressure. The problem is my gauge is telling me something differently. So I, uh, yeah, I, I'm a little bit perplexed as to what's going on. Uh, I know that my, uh, I've got a good sending unit. Uh, I have a Mopar unit in there right now. I have two other Berg Warners um, that I've swapped back and forth. Uh, I even tried uh, pulling out the instrument cluster cleaning the contacts to, to verify, to see if it was anything gauge related. Um, but, you know, I've already eliminated that really because of the testing procedure uh, that I did to ensure that the gauge has full sweep and, and control. So what am I left with now? Well, something in the wiring or potentially a brain problem. Uh, so that's going to be the next thing. I'm going to swap out the brain. I have a spare 98 brain. Uh, my oh, Jeep is a 99. Thank but, God. Uh, I thought you were talking about your brain. <laughs> no, I've got a, I've got a spare 98 brain laying around. I'm going to go all mad scientist on this thing uh, and uh, do some brain surgery here real soon. So we'll see what happens with that. Can you, I know that with the, uh, the temperature sens sensors, you can actually put a, a volt ohm meter or a digital volt meter on there and, and measure the, the resistance and, you know, verify it's uh, that it's accurate that way. Is that something that you can do with the oil pressure sensor and uh, just get a reading to see if it's, uh, I don't know how well, you can test the I've pressure though. I've got three different sensors that are all giving me the exact same reading. Well, yeah, so on the gauge. That is, that is unlikely, especially when two of them are different manufacturers. So this is definitely, uh, definitely a signal issue. I, I know it's not the sensor. So it's either going to, it's going to be post sensor for sure. 
I mean, there's there's no way that it could be the sensor at this point. Where are you so, measuring the oil pressure on the mechanical gauge? Uh, where the oil pressure sending unit screws into at that okay. Uh, okay. that um, a little adapter elbow. Okay. So well, yeah, that's it's and you know visual verification. I've got steady oil flow up at the you know inside the valve cover, mm -hmm. uh, so I know the the oil is making it to the top of the engine just fine. Uh, it's just my gauge is not reading what it's supposed to. Uh, combine that with the the odd overheating issue that I had uh, over last weekend, um, which I, it just out of the blue I get this you know beep and I look down I'm oh geez I'm freaking hot what's going on here? I pull off on the side of the road, uh, put it in neutral. Uh, you know I'm I'm stopped at the stop sign. I, I go to the drive to you know get my car or get the Jeep off the uh, off the side of the road as it were, and, and I look down and the temperature's normal. <laughs> like well this is interesting. Uh, so you. I went on my merry way, and about 15 miles later, uh, I get the beep again, look down, the temp's hot. What the heck? This time, I'm on the freeway. I've got plenty of airflow and whatnot. I just turn the engine off while coasting and uh, turn the Jeep back on, and temperature's normal. Yeah, well, this is that's, that, really that's that gauge crap thing I'm telling you about. Yeah, so it, it's, it's, I've got some other issues going on. Um, ever since that, that no bus problem I, things just haven't quite been right so yeah things uh, things are definitely interesting on the nine, northwest 99 xj <laughs> so tammy are you still searching for purple paint you know i found it i found it online i ordered it paid for it i got a phone call today from uh -oh. ariel in california from this place where i bought the paint sounds like a mickey mouse outfit I know. They cannot ship it to me because it's an aerosol can. Yeah, so my search what? begins again. Can you get, they, order it from someplace that isn't California? Uh, well, I can't find it. Well, I, you know, I can order it on Amazon, but I, I would have to buy a case of it. Oh, oh I think you could make good use of that case. Purple. Well, so <laughs> I was thinking, you know, maybe I could relabel the can and and call it Jeep Mama Purple and sell it to my Ooh, Jeep friends. Yeah, well, actually, you that's can get, that's one option, Tammy. I want you to I want you to look in your yellow pages or or, or do a little Google search for yellow you know pages. automotive paint retailers uh, in your area. A lot of these a lot of these shops uh, they that's all they do is they is they sell paint. And we're not talking about Arada or a Sher Sherwin Williams. Those people aren't going to be able to help you out. We're talking automotive paint distributors here, right. mm -hmm. and and these guys um, can mix you up. You know, oh, yeah. whether it be a, a factory color or something completely custom and drop it into an aerosol can or as many aerosol cans as you want, big or small. Um, some of these, some of the places do that. Some don't. You're, you are going to have to, you know, call around and, and start asking questions. Worst case scenario is you're going to you're going to get a guy at a shop that's going to point you in the right direction. Who knows? It might even be, you know, his cousin at a shop who's willing to do it for 20 bucks on the side type of thing, you know, right. so. Um, it just you well, know, let your fingers do the walking, as it were, and and uh, and start pressing the flesh and find out what you can get. Because you know, trying to order online and being forced to to you know get it uh, you know a case at a time, and and even then not being a hundred percent guaranteed that one you're going to get the color that you want, and two that it's going to be consistent across all the cans. So that's why I say right. you know deal well, with I something have, more local. I do have. The, the can that I have, I have what can here. I just, I'm yeah. not sure if it's going to be enough. It's the same mm. purple that I used on my, my air vent covers. Sure. So I sprayed those and I sprayed, I don't know if I did some D-rings with or not. So I just don't know if that's going to be enough. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I don't know how much spraying you can get out of a can. But anyway, Generally that's the bit. color that I, that I like. It's called Sumptuous Purple. Yeah, generally you can do quite a bit depending on uh, how many coats you do. So anyway, uh, that's it for Wheeling Wear tonight. And we're going to move on to, I'm sorry, that's it for the Campfire Side Chat. And we're going to move on to Wheeling Wear, getting ahead of myself. Yeah, this is where we're going to talk about what events are coming up in your neck of the woods and around the nation. We have the Toledo Jeep Fest coming up August 13th. Boy, that's just right around the corner. This is in the hometown of Jeep, guys, downtown Toledo, Ohio. For more information, head over to facebook.com slash Toledo Jeep Fest. We got the eighth annual Topless for Tatas coming up. Uh, registration might be closed on this one, but I think spectators are still encouraged to participate, guys. August 12th through the 14th, this, of course, is going uh, to help. Uh, well, it's a fundraiser for breast cancer awareness, and it, they raise a ton of money each and every year. Become a part of this, guys. Uh, for more information, head over to toplessfortatas.com. 
Uh, and we have the BF Goodrich 36 Hours of Uwari coming up August 11th through the 14th in Uwari, North Carolina. For more information, head over to www.36uwari, that's U-W-H-A-R-R-I-E dot com. Definitely one that you'll want to check out. I think I'd have a hard time saying Uwari if I hadn't uh, heard you say it. Yeah, so right. it's time for you to go to iTunes and subscribe. Did you know that it can take up to four days for your favorite podcast episode to show up on Apple iTunes? It's true. iTunes is a great free service, and we appreciate Apple for all their hard work. But we want our listeners to get JTS as quickly as possible. That's why we're recommending that all of uh, you iTunes users subscribe to our podcast. No multi-day delay. You get the newest episode much quicker. Uh, Open up iTunes, search for Jeep Talk Show, and hit that subscribe button. And never miss a great, funny, and informative podcast. And yes, I am talking about Jeep Talk Show, John. (laughs) And speaking of subscriptions, hey guys, we can use all the subscriptions we can get over on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Jeep Talk Show. Hey guys, every 100 subscribers we get, we get a cookie as well. A cookie. No, not really. But hey, it would be pretty nice. Nonetheless, guys, make sure you tell a friend, get them to subscribe. And if you haven't already, make sure you have your subscription in at youtube.com slash Jeep Talk Show. Hey, folks, and please think about joining the Jeep Talk Show team. We're looking for some volunteers to manage our vast social media presence (laughs) on the web. We've already gotten, um, I think, one or two have signed up. 20. 20. Okay. You can be the Jeep Talk Show social media voice. Just send an email to info at Jeep Talk Show to find out more. Now, that's, it. that's it for this week, guys. Wherever you are wheeling, if you pack it in, make sure you guys pack it out. Let's leave our outdoor recreation spots in as good, if not better condition than they were when we arrived. And remember to always tread lightly. Stay on designated trails and don't wheel where you're not supposed to. If you'd like to learn more about the tread lightly principles and how you can help keep our trails and public lands open for open use, head over to www.treadlightly.org. <laughs> And hey, guys, if you want to find out more information about what I'm doing here on the side and in my studio, well, I do have a professional voiceover business. If you need a voice for your service, product, or business, by all means, please check me out over at thevoiceofjosh.com. And you can check out my blog, follow my, me on my journey with my Jeep at www.jeepmama.com. Hey, you guys have a great Jeep week. We'll see you next week. Oh, and don't Our- forget to uh, hang on there, Josh. Hang on. Our- <laughs> and don't forget about our Tuesday night call-in show. Oh, yeah. You guys got to come 8 p.m. Central Time. We're there earlier. Uh, and uh, it's just me and Tammy because Josh is still driving home. But uh, join us over there. Uh, actually, join us then, but right here at JeepTalkShow.com. Bye-bye. <laughs>